I'm here today to open this session on uh, technology and innovation. And it has an emphasis on uh, technology as a force for good. And as a so-called unicorn, um, I want to demonstrate how technology has been at the core of my very being and success in technology. I think I can say without fear of contradiction that I'm the oldest person speaking on this stage at this event. There's a curious notion that some people have that um, older women aren't interested in fashion. Well, it isn't true. Uh, I may be nearly 90, uh, but dressing well matters to me now as much as it's ever done. And so does succeeding in the software business and at whatever else one puts one's hands to, which in my case uh, nowadays is venture philanthropy. I'm the first person to give so much away, about 70 million sterling, uh, as to take me out of the rich list. <laughs> Let me share with you my personal story. I've had an interesting life, but it wasn't meant to be interesting. And I wasn't always Steve Shirley. I was born Vera Buchtal into a professional household in Dortmund. But my father was Jewish. And in 1939, I arrived in Britain uh, as one, at the age of five uh, as one of the hundreds of uh, child refugees who were whisked out of Germany and Austria at the time of the Nazi uh, government by the kinder transport. So I'm a kinder transport child. And I was lucky. Um, my experience as a refugee might have scarred me forever, um, but instead I learned to be self-reliant um, and to make the best of what life offers me. <coughs> Excuse me. I learned not to be afraid of change, however disruptive it might seem. And as I grew older and more confident, I realized that change is often welcome. Indeed, that I could initiate change, and when it was necessary. And that sense of personal empowerment took time to develop, uh, but it's never left me. As a very young woman in the 1950s, um, I worked for the post office research station at Dollis Hill in North London. Uh, it sounds rather quaint now, um, but in those days it was one of the most advanced research organizations in the world. And some of the earliest computers were developed there. Um, and the work I was doing as a junior was still at the very cutting edge of technological achievement. In those days, I used to wear um, a grey skirt suit for work with a white blouse and a little black velvet ribbon round my neck in sort of a vestigial tie. I dressed as an honorary man. And this was what I thought serious young women doing a serious job uh, were supposed to look like, and I was quite happy to fit in. But I was less happy with my career prospects. I soon realized that I was a second-class citizen. The post office had two pay scales, one for men and one lower for women. And I resented this, when strong young men used to offer to carry my equipment for me. Um, I used to reply somewhat aggressively, I believe in equal pay and will carry my own things. <laughs> Nowadays, I sigh. Oh, how kind. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I was a woman in a world where women were promoted only reluctantly, 
deemed incapable of responsibility. You could always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top, and that comes from being patted patronizingly. <laughs> When I applied unsuccessfully for promotion, uh, I was told that uh, men had actually resigned from the appointments board uh, rather than have to consider if I was, should get the job. Why? Because they disapproved on principle of women holding managerial roles. So, in 1962, I decided to go it alone. I was sick and tired of sexism. And I wanted to build an organization that was family-friendly, flexible to the extreme. And I guess that other women would like that sort of environment, too. It was one of the first high-tech companies in Britain. It was called a freelance programmer, and that's exactly what it was when it started. And it was a pioneer in several ways. It was a company of women, a company for women, an early social business. A software house which recruited professionally qualified women who had left the industry, which was common in those days, on marriage or when their first child was expected. Our staff all worked from home, long before it was fashionable. Uh, one of our earliest projects was writing the software for Concorde's black box flight recorder. Uh, few knew or guessed uh, that the task was carried out by a team of 30 women uh, working from their kitchen tables with primitive technological aids. People told me, well, men told me, uh, that there was no market for a computer software house like ours, because software at that time was given away free with the hardware. And we proved them wrong. We were not above a little subterfuge. In the early days, when no one replied to my business development letters, and they were letters then, um, I learned that if I signed them, Stephanie Shirley, Nobody replied, but if I used the family nickname of Steve and Steve Shirley, <laughs> customers would not only read them, but pick up the phone to reply. And when they discovered that Steve was actually a woman, they were already half-hooked. <laughs> I started the business with all of six pounds in the year 2000. Sorry, it came out wrong. I started the business with all of six pounds. And in the year 2000, by which time I'd already retired from the day-to-day -day management, um, the company I founded was valued at almost $3 billion. Seventy of the staff were en route to being millionaires, and I was one of the richest women in Britain. By then, clothes had become important to me. For one thing, I needed to distinguish myself, not be mistaken for a secretary. I started to wear bright colors and, owned, and discovered the value of black and white. Um, I stuck firmly to jackets so that the men would not stare at my breasts and kept a record of what I wore so that I didn't always wear the same favorite jacket visiting a, my favorite client. And in the 1970s, to avoid sexist remarks about my legs, which are still good, incidentally, <laughs> I started wearing trousers. They were wonderfully comfortable. Eventually, my wealth gave me choices. I would not otherwise have had. And today, I describe myself as a venture philanthropist, dedicating to helping others benefit from my money. I'm the founder of several charities, 
mostly to do with autism. My only son, Giles, was profoundly autistic, and we began by creating a home for him, and now 150 young adults like him. And after he died at the age of 35, I founded Prior's Court School for pupils with autism, and the most strategic of the lot, the medical research charity Autistica. And those three charities together employ over a thousand people. And I did not forget the industry that made my wealth. In May 2001, three years before the launch of Facebook and five years before Twitter, I committed over 10 million to launch the world's first research center dedicated to examining the wide-ranging impact of the internet on our lives. This was at a time when uh, people were debating if the internet was here to stay. Uh, that company was called, organization is called the Oxford Internet Institute, part of Oxford University. It's done valuable, groundbreaking work. Its researchers were among the first to draw attention to the ph phenomenon of fake news and its impact. Um, it was an institute that defined the concept of big data and its teams have significantly influenced the debate about online harms in the UK. It's also addressed one of the most worrying aspects of our modern digital world, the digital divide. But how that divide is defined has changed in the last 20 years. Of course, there are still people in the world excluded by age, poverty or lack of education from full participation. And we must do all we can to bring them into the fold. But the more worrying divide today is between the corporate and institutional haves who dictate the terms of the online world with their extraordinary power and influence. And the have-nots, the vast majority of common internet users trying to navigate uh, an environment in which it can be hard to know what and who is the truth. Our reliance on digital technology has placed us in the hands of powerful tech innovators and the giant corporations they spawned. They're commercially driven, deep pockets, immense technical know-how. They have the power to influence our daily lives in ways few people understand. We need to challenge them and call them to account. So who can we trust to guide us? Traditional news, or news organizations are struggling to compete with the well-funded special interest groups. A generation ago, they would, would have had the resources um, to separate fact from fiction. Now, most of, us, most of them are focused on survival. Technology companies such as Meta and, the, and its competitors, they want eyeballs on their website and ads to support their business models. They build products. They provide content. They're not going to be the arbiters of truth. And it's not policymakers. Most politicians are overwhelmed by the comp complexity of today's technology. That leaves academia and institutions such as the Oxford Internet Institute, which focuses not on the technology, but rather the social, economic, legal and ethical impacts of this network of networks. 
Women's role in early computing and programming has gone unrecognized. And although a lot of women were involved in the design of the internet, most of the design was by men. And my generation of women fought many battles for opportunities for work and for equal pay. And I like to think of myself as a role model for other women. And I'm still busy, still active, still trying to bring about change. I'm not an old lady going on about fossils. <laughs> But beware, the older I get, the better I used to be. <laughs> When Mozart was my age, he'd been dead already for 50 years. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Dame Stephanie, thank you so much. And the reason I was so excited to have you lead this session is because you're not just a role model for women, you're a role model for everyone. And, and yeah. I wanted to ask a bit of advice as a fellow entrepreneur before you exit the stage. You know, for those of us, and there's many entrepreneurs in this audience, For those of us who are trying to build something like you've built, something with meaning and purpose that has a positive impact in the world, that uses technology in, in ways that, that you know, this whole session is about you know, using technology to power a better future. What is your advice for all of the entrepreneurs <coughs> here? Well, in a sense, the advice is the same advice as for survival. Um, you, you need to be in an organization or in a sector that you know and care about. Um, you need to do something different, uh, not just more of the same. And you need to think big, think international, even though you may start very small. It's not necessary to give up your job even to start a company because you can do quite a lot in the early days, just from weekends and evenings. So I, I mean, I found entrepreneurism really um, satisfied most of my creative wishes, um, and I am proud of having taken it to sustainability. Uh, it floated um, and has since 2007 was taken over by Sopra Stereo, which is a leading European organization. Um, so I think it, they are the golden rules of survival. Do something different, do it big, do it well, and think international. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.